Good morning and happy New Year's Eve, Promise Church family. My name is Emma and this is my mom, Betsy, and we are glad that you are here with us today. Promise Church is passionate about helping people follow Jesus, learn the Bible, and build family. I would like to take a few minutes to announce some very exciting things happening at Promise Church. Got questions? We would love to answer any questions you may have about Promise Church, whether you're here as a guest or a longtime Promise Church attender. Please stop by the information table at the ser- after the service and fill out a Connect card on the computer or the paper option. This is especially important right now as we get ready to move from Haines in February and want to be sure to keep you informed. Promise Church has been so blessed and we're so thankful for the continuing support that you've made possible. We have God-sized plans for 2024 and we really appreciate strong year-end giving if God calls you to that. If you'd like to help with a financial gift, you can drop it in the back. You can also give securely online at hispromisechurch.org. That's right. Prayer happens seven days a week, and so we would love to pray for you and your family during our services and during the week. If you need prayer, please fill out a card, a Connect card in the back, also at the information table. Also at that table, we have... Um, information on our regular weekly programs, but if you'd like, you can also check on our website at hispromisechurch.org. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope that you are blessed by our service. So for this point on, we're going to do something different. You guys are going to remain standing for the rest of the service, and I'm just kidding. You guys can have a seat. Uh, Good to be with you guys today. It's funny. I think uh, we're small today, but that was the longest greeting we had. So good job. I feel the love. Um, good morning. Uh, thank you. My name is Mitch McGrath. Uh, thanks for reminding me to say that. Uh, it's good to be with you guys. I serve as uh, one of the leaders here with the youth uh, and try to help out where I can. Uh, and today, uh, we're going to dive in to a couple verses. Um, Got to unlock my phone. And the verses we're going to read is Psalm 34, verse 4, and then Proverbs 2, 1 through 3. Um, And we'll start with Psalms. So chapter 34, verse 4 says, I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Now something as believers we like to focus on, uh, most of the time our spiritual high comes from What can God do for us? Or what has God done for us? He's healed me. He's transformed me. He's my comforter, my encourager. And we talk about all the things, all the blessings that we receive from God. And although we can talk about the fact that God hears us and he answers us and delivers us, I want to look at how this verse starts. It starts with, I sought the Lord. And if you had any week uh, or a week like I had, You had a rough one. Uh, It was definitely uh, just a hard week for me because I find it hard to sometimes seek the Lord. Um, Like, God, fill me. Comfort me. Give me me the words to say when I I go out and, and spread the good news. But like James says, you do not receive because you do not ask. You do not seek the Lord. And today, I want to encourage you but I want you guys to be convicted if this is you. Have you sought the Lord? And if you don't know what that looks like, um, that's good because I'm gonna talk about what that looks like in Proverbs. And something many of you guys know, tall dude, big Afro named Jordan, right? Jordan came in and he brought his friend Moses and Moses and Jordan, uh, I had the blessing of having them in Bible study with me. And Moses said something that has stuck with me ever since. And he said, when was the last time you read the word searching it like you were searching for your keys. And I'm like, oh, that's like, that doesn't really sound that cool. What does that mean? Um, And he's like, well, you get ready and you got to leave. You got to be someone you're running late and you can't find your keys. You're like, well, I'm just not going to go. No, you run around your house. You throw couches over. You're looking on your beds. You're asking your children, your parents, where are my keys? And you do not stop until you find them to get to the place that you need to go. And Moses is is like, when was the last time you read the word like that? When was the last time you asked or you were looking for something 
and you didn't stop until you found it in these beautiful pages that God's written. And this, I think, is just uh, adapted from uh, these verses in Proverbs. Uh, This is in chapter 2 and 1 through 3. It says, My son, if, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, this is the part you guys need to focus on, if you seek it like silver and search for it as for hidden treasure. When was the last time you opened up the word, searching it like you were searching for your keys? And the reason why this convicted me is because I take for granted all the times God's given me things without me asking. And I become so comfortable in the fact that I know God's got my back that I fail to look for him. In Psalms, I sought the Lord and he answered me. Guys, it doesn't always take us to seek the Lord for God to answer us because he knows what we need. But it's a relationship. And do you know how frustrating it is when you're constantly calling and texting your friend and they don't respond and you're always asking them to hang out and they never ask you to hang out? That's how God feels. He's like, yo, I'm knocking on your door every day. I'm like, hey, let's, 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 get, in, let's get in the word. Let's pray. Let's, let's worship. Let's hang out. And he never has you come to him and say, hey, God, I'm about to get in an hour car ride. Do you mind joining me and let's just hang out and talk? When was the last time you sought the Lord? And that's what I'm going to leave you with. And if that encourages you, that's great. If that convinces you, that's great. This is for his kingdom, his glory, and most importantly, your relationship with God. Seek the Lord. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord, King of kings, Lord of hosts, Prince of peace, God, I thank you so much, so, so much, uh, that we are still here as an outpost for your kingdom. Promised Church is still here, praising your name, building family, learning the Bible. And God, I, I just pray that as we continue past these holiday seasons, as we celebrate the new year, Lord, uh, New, Year, New Year's resolutions are great, but God, the one resolution that we all need is to have a perfect relationship with you. And I pray that for each and every person in this room, every brother and sister, every person in your kingdom, God, will seek you. Because as David says, I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered, and he delivered me. And God, I pray for those suffering Uh, right now through physical illness, maybe through loneliness or mental illnesses, God. Lord, we pray big prayers and we ask that you heal them. God, we know that in heaven you bless us with perfection, with no pain, with no tears, with no loneliness. But we ask here on earth, if you bring heaven down and you relieve the pain in our congregation in this world, God, Lord, only for your glory and let your will be done. But I do pray in Jesus' name, that your powerful hand of healing comes upon this congregation. And you already know the names of each and every one of those. And God, I I pray uh, just for Reno and his family as they're in Florida. What a blessing and an encouragement to see uh, just the family that that pours into us each week that is a pillar of this church, gets time now to just be in a refreshing place under the sun in your beautiful creation. I pray that they come back replenished, refreshed, but God, as Reno said before he left, hitting the ground running as he comes back to faithfully uh, preach and teach and shepherd. And God, I I pray just for Jeff uh, Pringle, Lord, if, if no one has noticed what he's been doing, God, I pray and I know that you, you do not let his works go unnoticed, God. And this is not a workspace face in no regard, but Jeff now, he's been a leader and an example for me and this congregation with putting up signs, with teaching the little ones, uh, and most importantly, just raising up a godly, fruitful family. And now as he preaches for the first time, I ask that us as his family, his congregation, just lift our hands toward him and Lord, flow into him right now. Lord, whatever he's written, whatever he's just put down on paper in your name. I pray that he preaches faithfully. I pray that we see God through him. 
And I pray that not only we are fulfilled by his words, but here he's fulfilled. Because God, even though the words are coming out of his mouth, we pray that it is your words. That he's being taught as we're being taught. That he's learning as we're learning. And God, I thank you for the blessing he's been. And I pray that now as he continues to just faithfully, faithfully follow you, I pray that we can learn from him. And I pray that we keep our eyes fixed on you and give all the glory to you. And everybody said in Jesus' name. Thank you, Tyler. Good morning. morning. Welcome to Promise Church. It's great to have you here with us. You know, um, we knew it would be a light service today with people traveling, people being sick, uh, out of town for the holidays or whatever. I thought it was really meaningful this morning. It was Hank and Eric and I here praying early, and Eric made the comment during our prayer that God doesn't look at numbers the way we look at numbers, right? So I think it's easy for us to kind of look and say, where, where is everybody? Why aren't there more people here? But God is here, and I, already it's been very meaningful and rewarding for me. So thank you to everybody. And I want to say thank you to the people who came and helped set up, because even though we're a smaller group, it still is just about the same amount of work. So let's give a round of applause for Eric and Hank and Wayne and all the folks that came to help make this possible. So um, we're going to start off with a little scientific experiment here first. So if I can have you close your eyes for me, please. I'm going to uh, count to three. And on the, on the count of three, open your eyes. I know you're tired. So on the count of three, please don't forget to open them. But all right, are you ready? One, two, three. And direct your attention to the screens. The... <laughs> I asked the muleys for a funny picture. Don't take this personally. They're not sticking their tongues out at us because they're in Florida and we're not or anything like that. But I just asked them for a, for a sort of a fun, silly photo. I think they're having a great time down there. But I just wanted you to think about when you opened your eyes just now, what, what happened? Probably think I just saw a silly, silly picture of the muleys, right? Actually, there's a lot more that went into it than that. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about that, that science. First off, light was reflected off the screen onto your eye, which is uh, the outside of your eye is called the cornea. Cornea is uh, kind of like the window at the front of your eye, right? Um, then the amount of light that came into your eye was controlled by your iris closing the pupil just to let the perfect amount of light in so that you could see this beautiful picture of the muleys up front. Uh, your cornea at the front of your eye, I don't know if you know this, is because it's round, what happens is the image actually gets flipped upside down. So what hits the back of your eye is actually an upside down image. The back of your eye is uh, called the retina. Um, the retina is an incredibly complex nerve center made up of what's called rods and cones. Maybe you've heard of those. And from there, the back of your eye, there are one, over one million fibers, nerve cell fibers that carry that data, this image, uh, to your brain. And then your brain processes it. And maybe you had some emotions that were triggered in your limb, limbic system. Ultimately, your brain takes that image and it files it away for a memory, right? Your brain also has an amazingly complex system of memories. Some it'll discard. This one will probably get pitched here tomorrow or something. But others stick in there for a long, long time, right? So uh, you know how long that process took for all that to happen? 13 milliseconds. So that's 13 one thousandths of a second for all that to happen, what I just described. And just think about the fact that your eyes and your brain are doing that over and over and over again, thousands, probably millions of times a day. And probably that information in of itself might make you, make you think twice about what you put in front of your eyes, right? Why, why put your brain and your eyes through that process? Our verse today uh, it talks about what we put in front of our eyes and what we put into our hearts and brains. Uh, it's Matthew. Turn in your Bibles, would you? Maybe somebody can give us the page in the Promised Bible for Matthew 5, 27 to 30. 774. 774 in the Promised Bibles. All right. You have heard the commandment that says, you must not commit adultery. But I say, anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. 
It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come and study your word together, Lord. Thank you that we have the freedom to do that. Thank you that your word addresses all of life's issues and can give us the strength and the wisdom to deal with all that we face on a daily basis, Lord. Our world is consumed with lust and continues to go further and further down a path away from your instructions for living a good life, Lord. So I pray that you would speak to all of us through your word today, Lord. I pray that even those of us who may not think there's anything in this verse for them, I pray that they might see that this, this address is so much more. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak to us and uh, work through me, Lord, in spite of my inadequacies. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So you may recall that back before Christmas, uh, Reno started a series uh, talking from the Sermon on the Mount, And I was talking about six different statements that Jesus made. And these six statements were very countercultural, undoubtedly, back then. They all started with him saying, you've heard this, now I say this. So last time it was about murder and anger, right? This time it's about adultery. But what Jesus is saying, he's addressing things that were traditions maybe handed down, or in our case, talking about uh, the seventh of the Ten Commandments, which is thou shalt not commit adultery. So don't commit murder, don't commit adultery, etc. But Jesus is saying, you know, this is the standard you've known, and now I'm, I'm raising the bar. I'm raising the standard, right? He's saying, just because you didn't commit the act of murder or didn't commit the act of adultery doesn't mean you're without sin. As we learned before, uh, that's the minimum, right? That, that's the, the minimum standard. The heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. So what he's saying is if you don't commit that outward act, which you've been focused on, that's great. But wh- what condition is your heart in? So today I've got three points for you from this text. Uh, the first is, number one, the eyes lead to the heart. The second is the heart is the battleground. And the third is regain the ground you've surrendered. So the eyes lead to the heart, the heart is the battleground, and regain the ground you've surrendered. Let's start with the eyes lead to the heart. He says in verse 27, you've heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. I'm sure this is like a, this was a staggering statement for the people listening, including the Pharisees, who were very proud of the fact that they had never committed adultery or committed murder. But I'm sure it rocked their world when he, when he put it this way, because their hearts were probably very far from the standard that he was setting. So is he saying we're supposed to all go around with blinders on? You know, we need to just don't look at any pretty women or don't look at anything I shouldn't. No, he's saying it's a look that leads to a longer look that leads to a condition of the heart. So what, so what is lust? He says to look at a woman with lust in your heart. The word for lust here is actually something that it probably could apply to any of us. It means to covet, to long for, or to the one I like the best, to set the heart upon. There's that key word again, the heart. So this is, like I said, indicating that lingering look. And one interesting point that can slip by, I think, very easily here is how is this verse written? It's written to primarily address men. It's not a men, man's issue only, right? But he says, if you look at a woman with lust, so clearly he knew that this was going to be a bigger issue for men. And we might, always, might as well acknowledge that. You know, God created men and women different, no matter what our society wants to say. Uh, and I like the way Tony Evans puts it. I listen to a lot of Tony Evans. He, he says that in the book of Genesis, you know, when it describes how God created Eve, it says he crafted her. You know, there was, there was, a, there was a lot of thought put into it. Whereas when he talks about man, man he kind of just took some dust from the ground and, you know, threw, threw man together, right? 
the, the male shape is not, not uh, anything like the female shape. But like many things, so God designed us men to enjoy the shape and the appearance of our wives, right? That's, that's part of his design. But like many things, God takes the perfect design, or Satan takes the perfect design of God, and he twists it, and he perverts it, and has led many people down a path of destruction. Obviously, one of those biggest methods of Satan is pornography. Pornography is one of the most popular tools. Studies have shown that over 70% of of U.S. citizens aged 18 to 30 years old admit to watching online pornography at least once a month, while nearly 60% of college students admitted to its consumption at least once a week. And as far as the culture we live in, I don't don't think I need to spend a lot of time on it because I think we all know the direction our culture is heading when it comes to this. One study that was recently conducted, more people felt that not recycling was a greater sin than looking at pornography. (laughs) So obviously our culture is going to continue going that way. They have a whole different view of, of sex and lust and these things than we do as Christians. I just want to add in here, I've kind of alluded to it, but if you're sitting there thinking, well, this, is, this doesn't really have anything for me. Uh, it's not an issue for me. I don't have a problem with lust. That's great. Uh, but I want you to think back to what the definition of lust is, to set your heart upon. I'm sure all of us at some point or another have set our heart upon something other than Jesus. Whether it's, you know, fill in the blank, a need for acceptance, control, power, possession, security, any of those things can easily in our world take precedence over Jesus, who wants that first place in our heart. All right, so what else does Jesus say about the eyes? We're focusing on the eyes. Turn in your Bibles to Luke eleven thirty four. All right, Luke eleven thirty four says... Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when it is unhealthy, your body is filled with darkness. Make sure that the light you think you have is actually not darkness. If you are filled with light with no dark corners, then your whole life will be radiant, as though a floodlight were filling you with light. Luke eleven thirty four to 36. Isn't that cool what light does? Light comes in and it chases away darkness. Darkness can't exist when the light comes in. He's saying what our illustration with the picture at the beginning said, kind of showed us through science. I think we, I love it when science actually catches up with the Bible, what it's been saying for thousands of years, right? When we view things, they, those images travel through our eyes, through our brain's incredibly miraculous processing system, but the ultimate destination and storage is in our hearts. The eyes lead to the heart. Research has clearly shown that exposure to pornography in teens drastically impacts them during their developmental phase when they are most vulnerable and uncertain about their beliefs and can often lead to depression. In marriages, its impact is equally devastating with nearly half, 47% of families in the United States reporting that pornography is a problem in their home. So it's absolutely critical that we protect what goes to our heart through our eyes and keep it healthy. If you remember in our study in the book of James, James said, temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So as Reno had us sing a few months ago, be careful little eyes what you see. That Sunday school contains Sunday school song contains a lot of wisdom. That's point one. The eyes lead to the heart. So point two, the heart is the battleground. I don't know if you're aware of it, but we are all in a war. It's a spiritual battle that rages every day inside of all of our hearts. I know there are a few Vietnam War veterans out there in the audience, I believe. I know one of them, at least, my father-in-law. One of the things that came out after the Vietnam War was a change in the way that our country approached warfare. It was said after the the war ended that we had fought what was called a limited war. 
Um, there wasn't really a full commitment from our leaders or our people, uh, and that's why the war dragged on and ultimately was unsuccessful. Since that time, our strategy has changed drastically. We don't go into a war with one arm tied behind our back. But I think that's what many of us do when it comes to the spiritual battle. Um, they might say, I'm going to follow Jesus, but I want to keep this, this one little secret sin to myself, right? No matter what it is, whatever, you're, whatever it is you're coveting or, or setting your heart upon. But if we leave the door open just to crack for Satan, he will come in and gain a foothold on the soil of our hearts. I know I've been guilty of this in my own life. Keeping that secret sin that we think we can control or we can manage, but if we open the door for the devil, he will come in. And he will, if we give him an inch, uh, he, he will take a mile. We've got an illustration that Deb came up with for you. That's me thinking I can give, give him just an inch, keep that one secret sin to myself or leave the door open. And we do that, he will come in and take a mile. So don't think we can fight the devil on our own or give him a little bit of control of our hearts because he's going to take over a lot more. That's what Jesus is getting at here. He goes to this extreme of saying, if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. This is pretty gruesome terms, right? It's kind of shocking to read. But he's saying it's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your hand, even your strong hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. So don't fight a limited war against the devil. Don't fight with one hand tied behind your back or think that you can give him just a little bit of uh, territory in your heart. And that's the interesting thing about this verse. As I was studying, do you think he actually literally means gouge out your eye and cut off your hand? Nate's, Nate's got it right, and he's shaking his head no. Believe it or not, there are people that have done that. They, they think this is a literal thing, and this is the extreme I need to go to. And they've done things to themselves, to hurt themselves. The, the irony is, though, I can still sin. If I have no eyes and no hands, I, my mind can still be full of perversion. My heart can be full of greed, lust, envy, you name it. So we get back to the heart of the matter is, is the matter of the heart. And that's the true meaning of what Jesus was getting at. And that's the thing that we need to focus on. Galatians 5, 16 to 18 puts it this way. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. Like we talked about, it's a battle. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under the obligation to the law of Moses. Galatians 5, 16 to 18. So remember, you are engaged in a battle. And don't fight a limited war by giving the devil even the slightest opportunity to get a foothold in your heart. That's point two. The heart is the battleground. Okay, so now we, need, we know we need to protect our eyes and we need to guard our hearts. But practically, how do we go about doing that? And secondly, what do we do if we have messed up in the past? I'm sure we all have, right? What do I do if I've given the devil that foothold? And what do I do the next time he comes knocking? Because we know he will. Point three is regain the ground you've surrendered. Jesus tells us to gouge our eyes and cut off our hands if that's what it takes. But as we said, he doesn't mean that literally. So what are the steps, practical steps we can take? I'll start with this. Know your weakest moments and have a plan for them. You know, like a football team, Mitchell was a football player, maybe there's some other football players here. One of the things that football teams do is they spend hours studying their opponent's film, right? They want to know every weakness, every tendency, anything that they can exploit. And it's a little bit scary, but Satan knows our game film, right? He knows the buttons to push and just the right time to push them. So we need to have a, a plan before those moments come. Remember what Reno had taught us before. HALT, that acronym, H-A-L-T. We're most susceptible when we're hungry, 
angry, lonely, and tired. So it's good to know that, but the next time that happens, what are we going to do? Let's see what the Bible recommends about moments of temptation. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 to 13. If you think you are standing strong, be careful not to fall. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. 1 Corinthians 10, 12, and 13. So in addition to knowing our weakest moments and having a plan, when temptation does come our way, according to 1 Corinthians 10, God will always provide us a way out. We got to find that escape latch, which is often God's word. That's the best escape latch we can have and have it handy for when those moments come. And, re- and rather than picking up our phones, which is what, you know, Reno is always talking about, carry that physical paper copy of the Bible. It's not a simply enough in those moments of weakness for us to just try harder. Or I think it's interesting coming up on the start of a new year. We talk so much about New Year's resolutions and the things we're going to do and the things we're going to improve. And I'm not going to do this this year and I'm going to do better and all that. But under our own, our own strength, we're, we will fall short. So we need the word of God to help us through. We need to replace physically. It's not enough just to say, I'm not going to think about this. We got to replace one thought with another thought. Philippians 4, 8, 9 says, and now dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your eyes, fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. So I think we need to ask ourselves as we start a new year, what percentage of our time are we filling our minds with things that are excellent and praiseworthy and um, noble and honorable and true and right? I know as the father of kids in this generation, there's a lot of junk. And even if it's not bad, or as Rick Warren says, even if it's not necessarily bad, it's still not necessary, right? It's just fluff. It's just, it's just eating those donuts. <laughs> There's no nutrition there. So as we wrap this up, I want to leave you with that final thought from the end of that verse. You can have God's peace in the face of temptation. Satan hates scripture, and he won't hang around long when we open the word of God. We can avoid some of this temptation by taking those steps that Reno talked about, by carrying our Bible, keeping it with us on our nightstand, bringing it to church, starting our day or ending our day with the Bible rather than with our phone. And he's right. You know, he and I were laughing. I was trying to use the Bible Hub app to do some research, and i go like 10 seconds, and an ad would pop up. And I'm like, seriously, on the Bible Hub app. So I don't know if I need to sign up for a subscription or something, but it was like... The temptation, the distraction is right there. Our screens have made it way too easy to be distracted, or far worse, one click away from those images. I heard Reno use the term candy-coated razor blades, and that's a disturbing, but it's a really accurate picture, right? There's an immediate thrill that comes with them, right? Like sugary candy that comes down, but when we swallow it, it, it cuts us apart inside. Regarding the screens, studies have made it clear, we need to shut them off, put them away at night. I'm guilty of this, and I know it's not good. Generally, I'm just reading about the bears, and that's just depressing, so there's no reason to end my day that way. Uh, Or I play Wordle, and that's fun, but it'd be a lot better for me to end the day with scripture. Either way, the temptation is right there, and it's a habit that I'm going to change with the new year coming up. On the plus side for technology, we we all use it, we all kind of live with it. There are accountability apps that you can put on to keep yourself accountable. Or you can find a person, an accountability partner to work with. If you want, come see me. We can hold each other accountable as we get ready to start this new year in 2024 and start with a clean slate. We've talked a lot about that side of things. If you're not married and you're dating, take the practical steps to reduce temptation and listen to the Holy Spirit's warnings. Don't put yourself and your boyfriend or girlfriend in those situations that are going to make it that much more difficult to stay stay pure. 
it's a whole lot easier to stay out of trouble than get out of trouble. It's another Rick Warren statement that he says, by the time you're alone or you're in the backseat of the car with your boyfriend or girlfriend, you're much more likely to be led by your glands than your plans. In other words, the hormones take over, so avoid those situations from the start and don't make it that much harder to stay pure. And if you're out there thinking it's too late for me, I've given the devil so much ground already in my life that I can't get it back. And I know he loves to tell us that. That's the flip side of his strategy is that he loves to then be our biggest accuser. I'll tell you this, that's, that's not what Jesus says at all. If you go back, and I invite you to read the story of the woman who was caught in adultery, his words simply were, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's what he's saying to all of us. And if you don't know him as your personal savior, all you need to do is ask. We've got a new believer's Bible up here for you. I'd love to share that with you. And we can talk more after the service. So uh, let's wrap up with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, which promises us strength to fight this battle for our heart, eyes and in our hearts because we don't have the strength to fight it on our own. Help us in this new year to protect what's in front of our eyes and guard our hearts from lust. Whatever it is that we might set our heart upon that's not from you, Lord. Thank you that you promise us a way out when temptations come. Help us to remember that temptation is temporary. And thank you, Lord, that when we have messed up, you clean us up and you make us right again with you. You make miracles out of our messes, Lord. So I pray that this message was an encouragement to those out there who felt they were too dirty to be clean again. And also for those who will maybe look at this idea of lust a little differently. Even if it's not sexual lust, that they might identify that issue in their own hearts. And I pray that we would all strive to set our hearts upon you above everything else. We love you, Lord. Amen. Originally, we were going to have Joey do our benediction today, but he was not able to make it. So when I was actually got the text from Corey telling me that, I was reading Daily Bread for today, which had a verse that I thought would be absolutely perfect for our benediction. This is Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the Lord, or from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep and ratified an external covenant with his blood. May he equip you with all you need for doing his will. May he produce in you through the power of Jesus Christ every good thing that is pleasing to him. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. Have a great week.